Welcome to the final episode of our Blue Planet Recontact series, everyone. We get into some really fantastic discussion this episode that we're really excited to share with you. But first, some announcements. I'm. This was like one of our better discussion episodes. I, yeah. like, I always love our discussion episodes, but this was this one was a treat. Yeah, this one was fantastic. First up. The Kickstarter for this fantastic game is still going strong. Mm -hmm. There's a little over two weeks left before it wraps up. And uh, obviously, we're not around next week to remind you about it. So if you haven't checked it out yet, please go take a look. Uh, one of the really cool things about this campaign is that by pledging to get the books, you get the whole catalog of the previous versions of Blue Planet in a PDF form. So you can... Uh, have that whole catalog if you want to go listen to see what is it series five six, six something yeah. like that um you can get all the books from that um so as soon as the campaign ends you will you'll get them mm -hmm. so it's a ton of pages of lore to look over uh potentially obsolete technology mm -hmm. <laughs> that you don't need <laughs> um but you can start planning your campaign and everything before you even get to the new book because you will have some of that world building material and mm -hmm. stuff to to look through so you can check our show notes and we have a link to the kickstarter in there and you can go see what that's about if you enjoyed these episodes absolutely uh, and finally, uh, this is, again, the last episode we're releasing in April. So this is your last reminder uh, from us in audio format. That it's your final notice. your final notice. Uh, that April is still Podchasers Reviews for a Good Campaign. So for every podcast or episode review left on their site, uh, Podchaser is going to donate 25 cents to Meals on Wheels. And if a creator like us responds to your review this month, they will double it. Um, also, whether it's an episode review or a full podcast review, we are going to queue it up for reading in our episodes uh, in the call to action section at the end of each episode uh, to thank you personally for bringing some joy and encouragement to our lives. And they really do help us out. I know we're kind of silly today and you'll hear about that in the outtakes, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, but uh, they, they really do bring uh, a nice brightness to our day uh, whenever we get these reviews and get a chance to read them. So uh, I love reading them because it's like this reminder that people actually listen to the show because it's that's the thing about podcasting is that you don't like you don't like see it happen or you know mm -hmm. we can look at the numbers and we have twitter followers and stuff but you don't really interact that way so it is always like oh people listen to our show and they don't hate it mm -hmm. that's so nice <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah so if you leave a review on podchaser uh we'll read it and we're actually putting them to the front of the queue for uh this month uh, to help the campaign along a bit uh so you'll hear a couple of them at the end of this episode that's all we have for our announcements right now. So enjoy this fantastic episode and uh, find us again after the show. Mm -hmm. Welcome back to our discussion episode, everyone. Last time we created our characters for Blue Planet Recontact. This episode, we will be discussing the character creation process. We are very thrilled to welcome back Jeff Barber, designer of this game. Do you want to reintroduce yourself again for everyone at home, Jeff? And tell us a little bit about the character that you made in our last episode. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Jeff Barber. Uh, I am one of the creators of Blue Planet. Uh, the original version and the new edition that we're kickstarting soon. Um, kickstarting I, now when this episode that, comes true. out. In podcast time, it's right now. <laughs> so check it out. I uh, am a game designer by uh, dedicated hobby and a school teacher by, by vocation. Um, and I'm just really excited, chance to be here and talk about character creation for our game, but character creation philosophy in general. 
Mm-hmm. And um, it's always a trip to hang out with Ryan and Amelia. So what is your character that you made for this uh, this little adventure? Um, well, I am one of the Pacific Investigation employees, uh, <laughs> our little um, PI uh, company on Poseidon. Um, his name is Zeb Smith. And um, my shtick is that I always say that and tell, tell whoever's listening that it's with an X and a Y. Uh, and let them figure out what that means. <laughs> um, and I am um, apparently the only player character that is an employee strictly uh, of our little company here. Mm-hmm. Um, I am, uh, if you're familiar with leverage, I kind of decided to be the the hitter, um, mm. the, the and the and the intruder. So maybe a, a hybrid between those two characters. Um, I'm I'm the the PI grunt, the gopher for the um, sort of legwork that needs to get done in real, in real meat space. Um, <laughs> I, I am the survivor biomod, uh, which means that I was genetically engineered before birth to just be durable. Um, mm-hmm. I am tiny and shy and um, my goals revolve, my, my motive, my uh, profile re- revolves around the goal of acceptance. Um, so I'm looking to find a family. Mm-hmm. Ryan, why don't you tell us about your character? All right. Um, I created uh, Saren Pacific, uh, one of the Pacific uh, siblings, Um, a mastermind with aspirations of stardom uh, would Mm. be my concept. And uh, she is a a transhuman, uh, genetically engineered uh, individual uh, with three moms. And... uh, uh, she just wants to become a, f- a famous singer, but uh, is kind of tied to this company as well and wants the best for it also. Uh, she wants to add more joy to Poseidon, uh, but as well as tell her own story. Um, and she's pretty hopeful, optimistic, but also rebellious. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, what about yourself, Amelia? Um, I made Maris Pacific, the other of the Pacific siblings. <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, She is a research-obsessed private investigator. I think the only one of us that is, like, really here to do some private investigating. (laughs) Um, Her whole goal is to save this family business um, from any kind of, like, corporate uh, overthrow. um, Mm -hmm. Because corporate corruption is the worst. Um, She is logical and careful. Um, She is... Also, um, I picked the cognitive synergist um, type. So very, like, smart, but not um, coordinated or uh, entirely, like, with it. Um, Mm -hmm. Unless she continues to go to therapy and and be okay, like so many of us. Yeah. Um, Yeah, but she's just, like, obsessed with researching and auditing and... uh, all that kind of really just fun hobbies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, let's go ahead and dive into our D20 for your thoughts segment. D20 for your thoughts. In this segment, as always, um, we like to talk to our guests and get their thoughts on the character creation process and character creation in general. So first, Jeff, a question about you as a designer. Um, Where do you feel like your best design ideas come from? And then how do they kind of present themselves to you? Um, This is going to sound like a joke, Mm -hmm. but I'm being dead serious. And I'm not making um, a lot out of one instance. Uh, uh, It is something that is so common that I actually take advantage of it by doing this thing. Um, when I'm working on a project, it's always in the back of my head kind of percolating. And I would say that the vast majority of my good ideas, because there's plenty of bad ones, come while I'm taking a shower. Yes. And uh, at first I just thought it was coincidence, but it is uncannily uh, productive <laughs> to the point where I'm, when I'm stuck, I will sometimes take a shower. Hmm. Um, and I know that sounds like a joke, but I think it has to do with how the human brain works that moments of inspiration come when you're not looking directly at the thing. Mm -hmm. Um, But your mind is partially occupied by something routine, like lathering your hair 
right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And the stimulus of the shower and the noise and the water. And it just sort That's of. The thing is, like, I think it's relaxing. There's like white noise. It's sort of like this quiet personal time where there is no other outside anything. Mm -hmm. Like, there's something to be said for that. And, and it has been, you know, there, I, I could point to dozens of moments where I've made breakthroughs in the design process. Now, of course, you know, I don't stand in the shower for hours on end trying to figure out a game. There's a lot of stuff <laughs> that happens in the dry spaces in between. Um, but, uh, no joke. That is a major part of, of kind of grokking through um, ideas as I need to for design projects. And, and now we know why you created a uh, water-based <laughs> RPG. Right. Yeah. Well, have you ever seen those like crayons that kids have though that you can like write on the inside of the bathtub? What? Like, I, there's yeah, they're made for like you know they're like made of soap or something. Well, then like, maybe but, I could like, do all the design in the shower at this point. So, like, there were times when I, because my siblings are much, much younger than I am. So, like, they used to be in the bathtub. And occasionally I would be, like, taking a shower and have a really good idea for, like, a paper or something at school. And I would take this, like, bath crayon and write on the side of the tub so that I could remember by the time I got out. And I'm just saying, you should maybe invest in I, some. I'll have to look into that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just, just beautiful mind it up in the shower. But, yeah. but more generalized, right? I mean, any every gamer, I think it's a fair question to ask any gamer. Anybody who games, I think at some point has to think, this would be, even if they don't ever take the step of writing the first word down, they still have in their mind a game that they would like to make, right? Um, and and the actual like ideas, I think I mentioned in a previous episode that I leaned into the idea that write what you know. Um, mm -hmm. and And given my background in, Ecology and marine science, it, and my love, just passion for science fiction, it was kind of a no-brainer to at least get the, the impetus for Blue Planet um, underway, and then just lots of showers afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, it, I get it, that, like, water world feel, yeah. though. You know, yeah, that's really exactly. just, like, be in the space. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so a more general question, uh, what do you look for in a system as far as character creation? Uh, like when you sit down and and either read a game uh, to get inspiration from it or uh, to actually play a game, uh, what pieces need to be there for uh, great character creation to happen? Um, I'll, I'll oversimplify a little bit, but um, maybe 10 years ago, I would have said it didn't matter, mm -hmm. that I didn't care about the mechanics at all. And that, because I've always been a kind of a setting guy, that's where my impetus really comes from. I, I like world building and mm -hmm. oh, to make, to make this some, something people want to mess with, I have to put some rules on it so that they'll, they'll buy it and use it. Okay. <laughs> um, but about 10 years ago, I guess, maybe a little longer than that. Um, I started thinking more about how settings informed the mechanics and vice versa. And, and, and that was not my own original thinking. It was just sort of the way the industry seemed to be going, right? Mm -hmm. And the more that you can connect your mechanics thematically to the to the setting and vice versa, and then, of course, the more your character creation then is informed by connections to the setting, the more um, I became, the, the more value I saw in in the mechanics. And now I'm a huge proponent of the more connections you can make between the two, the better. And mm -hmm. so character creation really needs to evoke the setting. Um, or if not the setting, I say setting because I like setting, but there's so many games that are kind of setting independent and are really focused on a theme or a feeling. Mm -hmm. you know. And the more you evoke that theme or that feeling with your character creation, I think the better that character creation is, or at least the better it serves the purpose. Mm. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, I know a lot of Powered by the Apocalypse games are are basically uh, that's baked in. Uh, you know, the 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 Stop Hack and Roll podcast uh, likes to call it genre bacon mm. um, because it's the the genre is baked in. Yep, that's good to that's the like that term. to the characters and and to the genre. whole concept. Uh, and it's uh, it's a fun little thing to say. Well, how how much genre bacon does this game have? how much genre is baked into the actual uh, mechanics and character creation process and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I always thought that was an interesting takeaway for what to look for in character creation as well. Uh, because if you, in the process of creating the character, you know how to play the genre 
that you're going to be playing in the game, uh, that's a real testament to uh, the design of the game and and how easy it'll be to get into character in this world. Hundred percent, hard agree. That's that's um, exactly where at least where my aesthetic is these days. Mm-hmm. How do we think that character creation in this game stacks up with other games that we've played, and how does it stack up with the original? Um, it's night and day to the original. The first, the first edition. This is this will be the third edition. First yeah. edition um, was a point by percental based system written oh. by someone who had just gotten out of grad school <laughs> for uh, eco- ecological science. So um, <laughs> it was simulationist. Yeah, the intent was that you could play like a miniatures game using it as well as the role playing game. Right, um, and I like to think. The well, second edition was a lot different and a lot better, and this is a very thorough evolution of that system, so that they're almost unrecognizable, though the genetic ties are still there. Mm-hmm. I like to think that this, the new system, is just as evocative, but is much more character and player facing, and it's not about simulating the mechanics of pulling a weapon and using it on a target, as it is about simulating what it feels like to be this person in in this setting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I I remember uh, we covered second edition and I remember the the characters in that was uh, a lot of the the 90s-ish mentality of what can my character do Mm -hmm. um, and how well can my character do that. Mm -hmm. Um, And and that that was very much there. But like a lot of the themes, I think that, the second edition had feels like it's here too in spirit uh which is interesting but yeah it's it's totally overhauled to be a person instead of like uh what can this person do it's it's focused on the individual yeah i, I think more. a good way to to give us a similar phrasing would be the second edition was what could the person do and then this edition is who is this person yeah mm-hmm. That includes what they can do, but there's more to it than that. Mm -hmm. How did they get to the ability to do these things? Um, Where did those abilities to do these things come from? What is the consequences of doing these things? Mm -hmm. I feel like we talked about that last time when we recorded about that difference between like, what can you do and who are you? And I don't remember if it was because you were like, this is a thing that I would change or if it was... um, That you had some of those, I I feel like it was because you had some threads of that in your game, which weren't in a lot of games at that time. And so it was like you had started to get there. um, And I feel like this sort of rounds it out and is like, no, for real. This is about like who you are and how you fit into the world as opposed to like, what are you Mm -hmm. doing? (laughs) Um, (laughs) You know, but I, I distinctly remember that being a conversation that we had last time. And I wish I remembered exactly like how it went or what it was, but it was a discussion of like, this game is, you know, like we want it to be less about what you can do. Rich Howard was also there. So it was probably something he said too. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> very possible. It sounds very rich. Like, uh-huh. <laughs> um, I, I like how, uh, like I normally people would say, uh, crunchy is a bad thing, but I, I do like how crunchy this feels but it's not like super crunchy in practice, right? Mm. It's like the spirit of the crunch. Yes. Effectively. Yeah, because um, you do get like with all you get like the option of like a lot of skills that you can do stuff with, but it's not like writing to like three percent here and two percent here and yeah, it's not here, overwhelming. You know, like, yeah. Well, I, yeah. I'm, I'm super uh, gratified to hear you say that because that was exactly the target we were aiming for, for a couple of reasons. Um, Primarily for me, Blue Planet is a really deep setting with a strong focus in real science. Mm -hmm. And it didn't make sense to have a completely narrative style mechanic system laid over that. Um, Mm -hmm. It didn't feel like a good match. But I also didn't want to recreate a simulationist approach. Um, And Mm -hmm. I didn't want to alienate the fans of Blue Planet who supported us with you know, a system that didn't make people 
made characters that felt like they were ready for this challenging environment. Um, but I wanted to do a lot of the things that more modern game design allows in terms of making char- making the game character focused and mm. not requiring a calculator at the table when you're making a character. In yeah. fact, um, I think uh, in the last episode, as we made characters, that was a couple hours of effort, but there was a lot of discussion that went in between the actual choices we made mm. um, and the dis- and the choices themselves are pretty simple and pretty straightforward. And now having done it a bunch of times myself, I can make a pretty flushed out character in about 15 minutes. Yeah. Right? There might yeah, be things I want like to add or change. A- difficult process like i think most of that time was because we were like hey what is this or like you know you explaining how to do it and then just making the choices yeah now Um, that you guys have been through it i imagine it would be similar for you you could sit down and plow through this really because there's nothing the numbers are simple it's a few integers here and there and everything else is is player chosen descriptors Mm -hmm. that really you don't even need to consult the book for if you know what goes there Mm -hmm. right yeah it's it's interesting. Like the the skill sets and the tags felt very much like coming up with aspects for fate or something like yes, that. Yes, I was thinking that. The tags mm-hmm. in yeah. particular are are very much um, you know, it's just a different version of that same implementation. Mhm. Yeah, exactly. Um and and the open-ended nature but like still kind of confined to like the general core and specialty uh was really interesting, like finding a theme horizontally yeah. uh, for those to fit the uh the the bucket that it goes into was really interesting as well yeah, and that's the that is the intention of making the characters represent not just what you can do but who you are um mm-hmm. how you got there and and um, why you're doing what you're doing yeah. really I, I mean you could boil it down to saying it is a game that has four attributes and five skills mm-hmm but it's not right i mean right. it's got four attributes and each one can have a focus a couple of focus yep. attributes if you want that really let you create nuance and then your skill sets are way more complicated than five skills but only in terms of what they represent not in necessarily in creating them yeah exactly yeah i think that it it gave me the feeling of like oh, I can do lots of things without having to have this compendium of skills that I have to double check and make sure it applies to this situation, mm-hmm. um, which felt like a really good balance because there are some games where, like even PBTA, where it's like you've got your five things or whatever, where it's like, okay, now I have to like make what I'm doing fit right. this thing all the time. And I felt like a little broader than that. Like I have more options. Um but I'm the kind of person that gets analysis paralysis. So when you hand me a book that's like, here's a hundred skills, I'm like, uh, like I, that's too much. It's too hard. You've lost me. <laughs> yeah, it might be. Um, it might be fair to say that. Imagine a slightly more robust Forged in the Dark system that mm-hmm. is got a Mad Lib component. Oh, I love so that. So instead of having to like pick from the two or three words that the system provides, you get to put the word in that you actually want. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and that's kind of the the target we were aiming at. I thought it was really fun too to have that like increasing specialty of like even just imagining of like the first level of like okay, as a kid I started with reading, and then mm-hmm. I, when I got a little older, you can do comprehension. You understand what you're reading. It's no longer phonics, you know. And then what is the next level of that? Well, now I can write my own thing, yeah. um, and that kind of. I think helped me imagine some of my character's background too of like, where did you, you know, where is baby Maris starting? And Mm -hmm. then like, here's where I am now. Um, I I thought that was cool too. And the way that like the skills kind of reflected that growth too. Yeah. I never would have got into a character with real time strategy games as a skill set without that sort of like free form, but also uh, contained uh factor there right it, i was like what is the what is what comes after logic right like yeah you know what do you do with that and it was like we'll take the lsat i guess mm-hmm. um but you know it's like okay now i like to do puzzles i knew we right. were pretty close to to done with the character creation section when i uh, as i mentioned previously started this group of uh, teenagers at my high school where i work um in a game group 
who'd never played role playing games before, and I was wrangling eight of them, and we <laughs> made characters for everybody in about an hour and a half. Oh wow! Um, so they'd never played role playing games before, and they made really interesting interconnected characters that all had well, most of them had backstories uh, baked in. Uh, mm -hmm. in in two hours with a chaos of eight kids whose attention spans you know arguably are right. no better than mine so uh, <laughs> it was it, it, ma it made me feel like okay i think we're where we want to be with with character design yeah, yeah if absolutely. we can do it in this situation we can do it anywhere <laughs> <laughs> that's absolutely. really cool um i really liked the uh c comparing the the ties to like uh, PBTA bonds and whatnot. Uh, it's it's interesting because uh, in PBTA the bonds that you have are like, oh, we did something specific in the past, or we're related because of this one specific thing, and and it feels very much in most cases like this is a backstory. This is how our characters are connected thing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but here it feels like we're connected in a certain way and there's an active obligation that will reinforce our role play with one another, yeah. which is really great. Yeah. I, this started actually from uh, Delta green. I don't know how familiar you guys are with the Delta green system. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't gotten to play it yet. I've heard Cthulhu. amazing things, but... but they have bonds, which um, are, you know, you, you identify a, a person, an NPC, like a, a, a boss, a, Coworker, a spouse, um, and you have a relationship with them that is worth a certain number of points. And at least in my experience, players and the, mechanically, what you use that for is you can strain that relationship to find to like calm yourself down to be less um, traumatized by the experiences you're having. Mm -hmm. uh, but it affects that relationship. Most of my experience with. Delta Green has been one shots, so I haven't seen it play over the course of, course of the campaign. Mm. But in the one shots, people just abuse it as like a sanity battery. Right. right? <laughs> um, and I wanted to see what it would look like over extended play. And so that was kind of my impetus behind the ties was I want this to be an active thing that par characters have to players have to consider as they go through a campaign. And that mm -hmm. they have to manage these and nurture those as they as they go along through the story. Can I ask then, what was the impetus for the tracks? Because I really liked writing them. Like I had a lot of fun being like, what, you know, what is this thing that we're looking to do? And then like writing the middle and upper level, like it was a fun creative exercise for me. Yeah. Um, but, like, so a lot of without games. Without playing, it's hard to. <laughs> uh, I, I love horror games. So I, I come mm -hmm. from that background. That's how I got started mm -hmm. in game design, actually, um, working on Call of Cthulhu stuff. But um, in games like that, there's the sanity track, which arguably is, you know, uh, an ableist kind of thing these days. But there's other games. Um, I think Paranoia has some kind of track like that. Um, I know that um, there's a Don't Rest Your Head has a, a track where you're getting more and more disconnected from reality. Uh, mm -hmm. And a lot of games these days that are focused on a specific kind of feeling have some sort of currency or some sort of progression that leads you towards a, a sort of a final state. Mm -hmm. I wanted that, but I needed something that could apply to all the different ways that someone could engage the Blue Planet setting. So instead of realizing that, you know, I, all I could have would be some kind of, instead of having just some kind of sanity mechanic or legality track where you're becoming more, more illegal or more of an outlaw, let's make uh, some guidance around making your tracks specific to your campaign and to your characters mm -hmm. so that you can pursue those kinds of emotional states for your character or those those um, states of mind or those uh, sort of outside forces that are imposing on you um, that are unique to the play the playing that you're going to do uh, and so that was the the intent behind the current structure yeah I I think we played with that a little bit uh, during that session in 2019 um, I remember liking it in play. Yeah, the track for that playtest or for that um, con game was the Red Sky Charters company that you were part of. Yeah, yeah, and it and you know it was a fly by night sort of seat of the pants family business, and everyone had a track where they 
were completely dedicated at one end and ready to call it quits at the other. Mm -hmm. There's a little mechanical hook in it that it can give you bonuses or penalties in some specific circumstances um, so that you pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's also a a tool that the moderator uses to kind of audit the state of mind of the group. Like, hey, don't forget, you know, this might be a cool moment in the game, but you still have this this thing going on in the background here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. So uh, how does the process then of character creation reinforce the feel of Blue Planet recontact uh, and set expectations for play? Um, I mean, I I kind of got the fluidic nature of it uh, that you can have these conversations like figuring out what skills apply to what situations. Um, I picked up on that right away from the character creation. Um, I think if I was being honest or mo- trying to be most effective, I would suggest that you guys answer that question because I'm yeah. kind of close to it and can't really see see it from orbit anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say that the I don't know that the actual mechanics, because the goal was to create characters that could be played in any kind of campaign in Blue Planet, I don't know that character creation itself is particularly thematic of Blue Planet. Mm -hmm. The the aquatic themes, the environmental themes. I mean, sure, some of the genetic mods you can get are Mm -hmm. clearly for aquatic things. And and there's a lot of like scientific recommendations for skill sets that are based in exploration and that kind of thing. But I do think that the mechanics could probably be used for any kind of modern day or or near science fiction kind of setting. Um, but I'd be, love to hear your guys' impression of the thematic tie-in or the reinforcement of the gaming intent behind it. Yeah, the because uh, I know you, you've got the the species, which really fits in with the uh, the themes of uh, Blue Planet. That kind of gives you a big uh, uh, in to the the whole scenario and the It'll sci-fi be a feel of it. For sure, yeah, yeah. Um, but then you've also got um, the uh, like the skill sets that give you uh, those different buckets. Like your past is important, your uh, your occupation is important, your present is important, your your the future that you're working towards is important. That sort of stuff. Um, I I know that that could be generalized, but it feels also important to blue planet as a setting as well because as you you say that i think i realize why it might feel that way because to answer those questions you're drawing from the setting yeah so as you're making the character you're forcing yourself to like answer the in ways that would fit the person into the setting so i guess that would be true if this was a game that took place on mars uh you would be answering those questions differently um, but I think by default, then maybe, it, and, and I'm feeling pretty happy about that actually in the realization that it draws it, it draws its own thematic connections. So that's good. Mm-hmm. I'm glad. I think for me, when I, when I look at that, I look more at how did building a character tell me like what the experience of playing is going to be like, even, even more than like the setting of the game or the world or anything, but like, what did it tell me about you know, like, am I going to enjoy this experience? Um, Because you, when you have a game where you have like a hundred skills, it tells me like, this is going to be kind of crunchy. You're going to be doing math. You're going to be, you know, and I'm like, that's not for me. Um, What this told me is that like, it's, it's pretty simple. Like the number of things that I'm pulling from aren't going to be, you know, like I don't need to combine eight different things from 40 different books. Um, But that there's a lot of room for me to kind of like move around in this world that we've created and Mm -hmm. that I have a lot of like narrative control. Um, Because over the course of this, I set out like, you know, what are the kind of skills that I've had? I've said, these are things that exist in the world, like auditing. That's a thing here because I have made that skill. (laughs) Um, You know, I've said that there, there are puzzles and riddles because I made that skill. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Ryan has defined now there are real time strategy games. Yep. Um, so that <laughs> tells me as a player that that I'm going to have a lot of narrative control. Um, mm-hmm. It's told me that like work is very important. 
um, because we've set out that we work for this PI, PI agency. I want to save the company. I like all of the things that we created are around the job that I'm doing. So mm-hmm. like in our game, those are important. Um, so I feel like it's the sense that I get is I will have a lot of narrative control. Um, it's, it's really open. And if I want to do something, there's probably a way that we can figure it out. Um, and that like the things that are on my sheet are extremely important to the campaign that we're going to be playing. Mm -hmm. Um, because in so many spots, like we started writing this campaign and saying like, these things are going to be important because this is what we put on our sheets. And so I'm getting the sense that it's like very player driven, regardless of like the setting or anything like that, that like those are things that I'm going to experience. I think that's a fair assessment, but I, I don't want to take too much credit for that because I think we kind of did a little pretty good session zero as in between as we were making our characters. Sure. Mm-hmm. I, I do think mm-hmm. if I sent if I had sent those those kids home to their to their dorm rooms and said, make a blue planet character using this checklist, and then they all came back, uh, they wouldn't have had any of the sense that you were just describing. Right. Because yeah. everything you'd would have be eight a big different jungle. campaigns right. is what right. you'd have. I think a lot um, of our I think your observation is particularly astute in terms of the front loading because of the way the characters are made. You're, a lot of the player agency isn't necessarily mechanical as it is in some games because there are a lot of games that depend on player agency to move the mechanics forward, mm-hmm. um, especially in the narrative lines. Uh, Blue Planet is a little more traditional in that regard during play, but there is a lot of room in front-loading the characters because of the way that the attribute focus attributes are made and the skill sets are made and you build the yeah. ties and things. Uh, and then also in play while you're interpreting what it means to have an accounting skill or to mm-hmm. be, um, in my case, friendly, right? Um, mm-hmm. How does that get interpreted in play? And so I think there is room right there for some player agency that's um, maybe more uncommon in more traditional games. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And and I know the biomods are a big part of character creation as well. Um that kind of, I, I like how it's near the end of the process because then it kind of gears you into the world a bit more. Um, that it it says, yeah, this is this is a game that has uh, some some interesting equipment and uh, modification things that you can do after the fact if you want. Um, that if you save up your money and. Uh, you you can you can get these cool other things so it's another like interesting in setting goal that you mm. can add into the uh into your campaign as like a side quest effectively right um and then getting a hold of the whatever supplements that you have that are like here's 300 more biomods right. that you can throw in or whatever um or or uh uh, even if a game master or a group wants to create their own, you know, um, just something cool that you can work towards, right? Which right. would be uh, an interesting peek at like this world has fantastic technology, and and it it gives you an understanding that you're playing in the future, not playing in the present, set in the future. Mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. which is really cool yeah and, and you and when having to pick your species right from the start you're still a human species but you've already made a formative decision that's going to help inform all the other questions that you have about character design yeah. well and even like what species we picked like immediately you were like okay well you're not from here then and it was like oh good point um you know like that already started setting up what the limits of this campaign might be mm-hmm um yeah i think that there's like a a lot of what we did in character creation decided a lot of things about our campaign um should we play this game and so i think it it made character creation important in a way that it sometimes isn't like sometimes Mm -hmm. it's like i fill out my character sheet and i show up and then the game happens and i'll slot myself in somewhere and this is not that I'm glad to hear it because that was kind of the goal we were going for, but wanting, but not wanting to make it uh, overwhelming or require a deep immersion to 
be able to do it effectively. Yeah. I mean, I feel like you hit that sweet spot for me, at least, of like not handing me a list of 8,000 options where I get overwhelmed, but not just saying, do what you want, (laughs) where I Mm -hmm. also get overwhelmed because I'm like, anything? Um, (laughs) Like this felt like a very good, a good middle ground of like, I can make things happen, but you've told me what things. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, And that's for me, like, Perfect. <laughs> well, going into the, going into the, the Kickstarter, that's very reassuring. Mm-hmm. Good, good. It's the it's the chips and salsa on the Jello to sand. Uh, yes, the continuum. Jello to sand continuum of crunch eat. Oh, <laughs> there it is. I've never this heard of my, that one. This is my my this game is, design theory of like you know awesome. some things are too crunchy. Um, sometimes you're just chewing sand, okay. and you don't want that. Um, and then there's Jello that's just like real wiggly and not. Really I guess it's it. kind of in a shape. You're like this is roughly game shaped. But that's the mm-hmm. one form it holds until you cut into it, and then it's yep right. Then it's right, and so you want to be in like the like chips and salsa kind of like I crunchy, love but it sa- could be a little soggy if I you love left chips it in and there. Salsa. That's good. There mm-hmm. you go. See, that's so this is right in the chips and salsa sweet spot. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> I'm gonna write a book on my game design theory. At least an essay. <laughs> right, the sand yeah. to jello scale. One of the things that I get really excited about in games is character sheets. Um, I filled out lots of them. I saved them all in a folder. Um. Let's discuss the intention behind the design of the character sheet. I know it came up a couple times as we were going through that you're still kind of working things. And there was like one or two spots where you're Mm -hmm. like, we got to put that back on there. Um, But can you talk about like what kind of story it tells um, before you even begin making characters? Like what influence the character sheet has on the design process the other way around? Um, Love to because uh, it's something I kind of discovered in recent years as being an effective tool. Um, I, I uh, wanted to avoid having to write everything down um, and iterate from there because iterating on writing, at least for me, is not very efficient because I'm a slow writer. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm much more of a visual thinker and graphically thinking about the character sheet um, and the tools that were needed on the character sheet to do the game that I had in mind made it a lot easier to just iterate on a character sheet rather than iterate on a word doc. Um, and the, so that was one, that was the starting point, right? So it really came down to sketching out some different character sheets with just a pencil on blank printer paper mm. until I got to the point where I had something that was usable for the first play test of the new system. And then I would use Illustrator to just make up something it's if it tells you anything um i think the character sheets you guys have are for version 4.5 hmm. and usually i have to do a pretty big fundamental change to change the version number yeah um, and i don't have any schema it's just in my own head so i can compare <laughs> them in, in my folder right um but uh i think we're pretty close uh and so on version 4.5 you can imagine there's been a lot of a lot of changes that have happened Um, but when I finally sat down to write the character creation that you guys are on, we're already on version point like four point something. So there hasn't been much change since the document that you guys worked off of today. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was great to just be able to put the character sheet down in front of me and write the character creation section step by step, um, from what I had learned from playing with the character sheet. Oh yeah. Um, and so that, that was sort of like my personal sort of design approach. Uh, the other sort of tenant that I wanted to make sure we were trying to include, and I, I'm sure there are places we can still do this and I'd love to hear your suggestions. I wanted as much of the guidance for making the character to appear on the character sheet that we mm-hmm. could fit in. That was, that's my favorite thing. Maybe a game design nerd thing, but that's my favorite part of Forged in the Dark is that the character sheets themselves pretty much guide you through the process. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I wanted that to not only be reflected on our character sheet in the character creation process, but also during play, to provide some references as well. Um, mm-hmm. At least as many as we could cram in and still be a reasonable character sheet. So I hope that's kind of the, at least the ballpark into which we've landed, and we're going to continue to try to refine that a little bit. I noticed, like now as we're talking about it, um, that there was only 
one point in the character creation process where I said, hey, where do I write this? And it was a thing that you said, oh, shoot, did we take that off? We have to put that back on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> otherwise, though, because there are lots of times where we go through games and I'm like, OK, we just came up with this stat. I don't know what box this goes in because we've kind of called it this, but it might go over here. Like there, I had none of that. It was very clear to me. Like this goes here, this goes mm -hmm. here. And we went like right in order down the line, like box by box. Um, I don't think I really had to look too much at the, uh, the, the mechanics list because it was like everything on the sheet was what was in the, in the doc you sent us. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, obviously I would have to more if you weren't here to just like tell me things, but <laughs> it was really easy to just like go section by section. These things are, um, you know, this is what's next. And that's mm -hmm. really how it's presented in the write-up is it, there's a list of, I think it's 10 steps and you just follow the steps, some number of steps you follow each one and it leads you through the process, hopefully in a way that builds on the previous decisions you made. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and anybody can do it even if they aren't familiar with how the game plays. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because um, when you go through the sheet itself, when you're just visually looking at the sheet, um, you can see that uh, it's laid out in a way where you can, you can easily grok where you're competent and, and potentially lacking in a mechanical sense, right? Um, but also... Uh, for the character creation process, it's you just go down the line from like left to right, up top to top, bottom, and and you've got your character made. Uh, and then it continues on to the second sheet, and it's all just kind of right there, uh, which is fantastic. As somebody um, who is like also a visual person too, though, it's very clear to me from the size of things on this sheet that attributes and skill sets are the things that I'm going to use the most. Yeah, and mm -hmm. that's the intention. Because they're bigger. <laughs> um, um, and like that, I, like I know it's such a simple thing, but it's like, oh, those are where I need to spend my time and my points. Yeah. And like, they're bigger. <laughs> well, I think I was telling you before, the skill set box needs to be even bigger, in my opinion, mm -hmm. um, because you need to be able to write more than we were writing in there, as well as the tags, tracks, and ties. Um, mm -hmm. And we did try to make it so that really to play the game, you're looking at the first character sheet 90% of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, a two pages for a character sheet, that's over some people's limit. Um, yeah. So you don't really need the second page. The second page is more um, sort of general reference in the background. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're trying to make sure we keep it that way. Yeah, I like that. Uh, yeah, it adds detail to your character. Um, and yeah, you've got the bio mods and gear and weapons and all that on the second sheet. Um, and I see this uh, this maneuvers, which uh, tells me it's important. Well, that, that uh. box is way. The graphic designer kind of uh, went a little a little uh, far afield with that one. That box is considerably larger than it needs to be because it's just reference. Yeah. Um, you don't actively use that box unless you want to start creating your own maneuvers. But yeah, uh, it, it's probably going to be about a third that size. But it, it does tell me something about how the game's going to be played. For sure. A bit, which we is interesting. We wanted it on the character sheet. Um, and if it's on the character sheet, it should be important, right? Exactly. Yeah, and that, that tells me a bit about the intention behind keeping it on the character sheet, right? Um, to say, hey, while I'm playing this game, maneuvers are going to come up. And they're going to be interesting because it's there. And it's readily available, which is cool. The, the intention behind them being there is, as I was saying, with the Forged in the Dark, a lot of play is guided by the character sheet. Mm -hmm. And much of what your character does when they are opposed by either NPCs or natural forces or what have you boils down to these maneuvers. And yeah. being able to think in the general terms, um, rather than getting lost in the minutia of what skill set specifically fits this circumstance to be able to break it down into three options for each of these categories which helps shape people's thinking and makes it a lot simpler for them to choose the skill set they want to use and that's mm -hmm. why the reference is being included like that very cool well 
What do you think then, uh, this is one of my favorite questions, uh, just because, especially when we have designers on the show, um, <laughs> what, what do you think is one of the, the biggest flaws of character creation in the system? And what do you think is one of the best parts of character creation? Um, flaws. I think that, um, it's funny because even that sort of language anymore smacks of the oh, this system is better than that system, right? right? And it's, and I think a lot of people are getting to the point where like all systems should coexist together because people like mm -hmm. different stuff. Mm -hmm. um, if, if I was just going to play Blue Planet by myself all the time, um, I think I would have more attributes. Because mm. I sometimes struggle when I'm running the game to be able to answer people's question, well, is this cognition or psyche? I'm like, mm -hmm. uh, well, okay, whatever. Yeah, just whichever you prefer. And of course, the default then becomes, well, I'm just going to pick the one that's got the best stat. Right. Um, yeah. So uh, for me personally, that's what I would maybe change if I was going to um, play it just for me and not try and have a broader, more uh, um, accessible approach. Yeah, um, that makes sense. Uh, conversely, uh, or maybe it's perfect parallel. One of the things I like the best about it um, is the fact that we have these focus attributes that you can add in, um, and they are absolutely customizable to the player and therefore the character. And so you can really start to nuance those four attributes into something that um, really represents the exact character you want to play. And mm -hmm. I think that was the the whole point in that design process was like I don't like just having four attributes, but I don't want. There's no way to have if you start breaking them out, it suddenly doesn't become five attributes. It becomes like 10 attributes. Right? Yeah. Um, so when I struck on the idea of these focus attributes and being able to customize them, I became comfortable with presenting just four basic attributes and still being able to make the nuanced character that I wanted to make. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I, I love the focus attributes for the the role-playing potential, potential, the the guidance uh, potential for the players um to to play towards their their character sheet um uh, which honestly sounds like a, a fun topic for character evolution cast whenever we get around to that uh playing towards your character sheet yeah. um because like the whole uh idea of being able to look at your character sheet and know what your character would do uh is kind of the the impetus of what role-playing games should be mm -hmm. um Whereas, like, some games, um, I won't name names, but some games you create a character and they can do all sorts of fun, cool things, but then you have to shoehorn a background into it and mm -hmm. a personality and why your character cares about anything in the world that's, like, separate from the system. And then now you're playing to something that's not on your character sheet. And it goes right. back to what we talked about earlier, what your character can do versus who your character is exactly yeah. yeah so like not like having the motivations having the goal having the attitude having the the specific uh attributes uh and the modifiers of those things the defined attributes and all that sort of stuff uh it really lends to i know what how this character would kind of respond based on all this cool stuff that's on my character sheet um and and I like that it's it's all right there on the first page and 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 available to you at any glance, right? Mm -hmm. Well, let's discuss our character stories here. We'll get into our our fan fiction Ooh, section. Fan fiction. Um, what? Let's just like our first adventure. Let's say like what what are we doing and how does it go? Yeah, what are we up to? I would love if it started in media res. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So like mid. Hi, I, is it a heist? Is it like, I don't know, like, what are we private investigators? <laughs> what are we doing? We're, um, we're not I think very we're undercover at a jazz club. Ooh. Um, Ryan's character is performing. Oh, mm. nice. So we must have, um, we must not be in our little rural office town. We, uh, or rural town where our office is, we must be in a bigger city to have a jazz club. Um, yeah, we went to be. the next biggest city, which has like 3,000 people. <laughs> okay. So there's just a music venue, and tonight is jazz night. 
It's yeah, it's yep. like a it's really a bar with like a okay. tiny stage. Okay. Um, we call it the jazz club. Right, <laughs> right. No, that's the name of the oh, bar. Okay, got it. That's good. <laughs> yep. Even better. Um, I mean, I assume there's probably like some kind of information that we have to get while we're there. Um, but mm-hmm. we definitely used it as an excuse. So for... can the opening scene be me being punched and then falling backwards and then freeze frame? And then it says two hours ago. Right. Yep. Like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. And um, gosh, I, I can imagine that uh, that my character would be uh, just trying their best to maintain the attention of mm-hmm. the audience so that both of you can you know, easily do what you need to do to get the information from people that are, um, you know, otherwise distracted. So is this an open mic night or are you actually booked in to be singing tonight? I want to say we booked me in to sing for this specific purpose. Okay. Uh, knowing that, um, and, and I want to say this is a, a genre outside of the, the genre that I'm interested in getting into. Okay. Oh, right. Um, to add that little bit of complication, right? <laughs> you don't have a you don't have a deep uh, catalog of songs that you've practiced. Yeah, exactly. Um, but like the Blues you know, Brothers playing in the country bar. <laughs> yep, <laughs> kind of like that. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so I got to keep the audience distracted while you two uh, figure stuff out uh, on that side of things. But w- what are we? What are we here to figure out? I feel like we're trying to like there's a conversation happening that we're just trying to like record or something because we're not we're not thieves we're not like you know like we are a PI like a rural backwater PI association yeah. um so I feel like it's just um like let's say it's like a like an eminent domain dispute or something well, <laughs> um, you wanted to break you wanted to um break in corporate Right. Mm-hmm. And and what if there was a local uh, the local miners were the independent miners are trying to form a collective, essentially a union. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, there was plans. We would somehow been hired by them to figure out who's trying to bust their union. Mm-hmm. And so oh, yeah. a meeting meeting here tonight between whoever we think is bust, trying to bust the union and their their union busters. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah, they're muscle. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, so Zeb, I imagine that you're probably here in case things go south for whatever reason. Uh um, yeah, I, I maybe can I be waiting tables? Oh yeah, mm-hmm. that sounds fun. Why yeah. are you getting punched in the face? Oh well I guess we'll figure that out. I, I had to have been discovered at some point, or maybe oh, you know what it was? We were about to get made. Mm. And and so I started a fight with someone randomly. Because you know that happens, right? I make something right. spill on somebody, and then I say, "Oh, dude, what are you doing?" And then it just <laughs> went from there. Oh, it went from there. <sighs> Did we get the information though? Uh, we'd have to roll some dice to find that out. Yeah, oh boy, we don't roll dice on the show. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I would say I would say probably not because that's the complicating mm. open. Now the credits roll, right. and the show starts. So right, now we have that's to come the up complica- with the second, the second way to get the same information. For yeah, the rest of so the like the, the show starts and it's us sitting in a diner and you with like a steak on your eye. Yeah, like- <laughs> piece of tissue paper up my nose. Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and then, uh, then I can see like my tactical brain working. Like how can we salvage this, uh, this you know, blow against our, our group and tactically figure out a way to get the information that we need. Mm-hmm. And maybe now it turns into a heist. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like oh. our reputation as a company is on the line to get this information. Yeah. Um, and we we really need uh you know this to come out into the open so that these uh this minor group can can unionize successfully and uh become a successful group of uh employees. So I feel like we're going full leverage here, um, which is awesome. Uh, mm-hmm. So I think the name of our of our campaign series would have to be something like Fulcrum or whatever to like yeah. take advantage <laughs> take advantage of that. Yeah, that sounds really fun. Yeah, uh, and then we're kind of all trying to we're all we're all going against type a little bit. Uh, 
having to do this heist like thing. Like we're all not trained for stealing information and stuff no. from wherever, but we've got the computer know-how you, you, uh, with your, your skills, uh, Amelia mm-hmm. could, uh, easily find out the financial, uh, situations and where the money's funneling to, in order to get the, uh, the union busted, so to speak. Yep. Uh, but we just have to get in and I, I see myself kind of more like the face character trying to talk our way past situations in a way. I do have um, interrogation and undercover work. You are the so. performer. Yeah, I, I'm the performer, and I've also got, um, like, especially if we are dealing with like younger individuals, uh, trying to work our way through like uh, the the interns of the organization, so mm-hmm. to speak. Oh, uh, fellow youths. <laughs> yeah, the fellow youths. <laughs> <laughs> How do you do, fellow youths? Uh, Even yeah. older. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I think that would be really interesting. Um we've got a lot of avenues to to utilize our life experience to get this information. Mm-hmm. I feel obliged to point out that if I, I would imagine someone picks up Blue Planet off the shelf and starts thumbing through it, <laughs> they're not immediately going to go to like mom and pop PI campaign. <laughs> <laughs> just screams that's what i want to play well um, why not <laughs> and well but the, the the point is the point i'm trying to make is i'm super excited to play this campaign i want it to be like one of our archetypes that i was talking about now mm-hmm. but mm. that is a callback to what we talked about right like the setting is so big you can play any kind of game you want to and the yeah. resources are there to, to set it up um and I, I think it's interesting that that's where we settled on on the start of our little creation cast campaign yeah, yeah. <laughs> given, given the alternatives that are in the setting yeah the plethora of other options right. there are yeah. this is where we went <laughs> it's, it's interesting we combined corporate espionage and rural survivalist uh to to get to where we are here and i i think it's really cool that this game can support all of that mm-hmm well, finally, let's get into our, our last segment here, our advancement discussion, and we will take it up a level. Mm-hmm. Take it up a level. Take it up a level. Oh, I see what you did there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, in this segment, we like to cover uh, character growth and character advancement in the system. So the first question we want to ask is, how does a character level up in Blue Planet? And how do characters change mechanically when that happens? Um, the, the answer as it exists in the moment is quite simple. Um, but I'll preface it by saying a lot of the playtesting I've been doing has been one shot ish. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there really hasn't been a lot of playtesting of advancement, uh, Mm -hmm. though we have advancement rules. Uh, so I, I will say that these, these may change, um, between now and publication, but the attention is to again, tie the characters to their environment and their actions to the mechanics um, in a way that motivates them to be their characters. So advancement is based uh, entirely on your character profile, and um, that includes your character's goal, motivation for that goal, and the attitude. So um, in kind of rising order of importance, perhaps, uh, attitude is your character's the way they interact with the world uh, is a simple way to describe it. Their motivation is why they want what they want, what's mm-hmm. driving them to that. And then their goal is the thing that they're reaching for. And it it's more than just to go out on Friday night, um, short-term type goals. It's um, long-term goals. Like, do you want a family? Do you want to move to the big city? Do you want to become uh, powerful in the corporate world? Do you want to free Poseidon from its corporate oppressors? That kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and If you demonstrate your attitude, uh, and I'm I'm winging it, I don't have the rules up in front of me, so I'm going to wing this a little bit, Uh, so forgive me if I'm not exactly right, but if you uh, play your attitude, uh, so the idea is at the end of every session, you do a little inventory with the game master and say, Mm -hmm. hey, look, I did this thing, I got punched, my character has this attitude problem, um, and I I used it to to get punched to cause this distraction, Um, that then I get a little 
checkbox. Uh, and on the character sheet, you'll notice there's chips, the character improvement points, the little circles. Mm -hmm. You just check one of those circles. Uh, maybe you did it twice in a way that was significant in the game. It has to have like an impact on the narrative. It can't just be you grinding away on on points by saying, look, I used my attitude because I swore. Every time I was grumpy. <laughs> yeah, right. right. Yeah. <laughs> it has to have a narrative impact. And that, there's some guidance in the, in the rules about that. Um, same with motivation. Uh, but with motivation, it's a little harder to demonstrate that motivation to drive the narrative with your motivation. Uh, so maybe maybe you know you're supposed to be doing this thing to support the company, but you really want to do this other thing. And so you kind of make problems for the company and the rest of the players because you pursued your motivation instead. You get two two check marks for that. Mm. And usually it's once per session. Maybe if you really lean into it, you get twice per session. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, achieving your goal um, is, uh, I think, it, it's not achieving the goal, but it's benchmarks towards your goal give you like five checks. Mm -hmm. right? You don't have to line out benchmarks. It's not like you have a timeline and a you know a ten year plan. This is my character's five year plan, and they write <laughs> out there. Um, but you tell the moderator like, "Hey, look, I I spent all the money I made last session on this on this map so that I can find where my dad's boat went down." Um, mm -hmm. As in your goal of like finding your lost dad or whatever your goal happens to be, um, and if you do one of those, you get you get five checkpoints. Mm -hmm. And then um, you get to spend those like a currency uh, on character advancement. Um, uh, I think it's five, 15, and 25. You can spend five points to um, add a plus one to a skill set. I think you can spend five to get a one, maybe it's 10, to get a one in a new skill set. So you can say, you know, I've been, been playing the guitar a lot in my room over the pandemic and I've learned to play the guitar. So I've got a one in guitar uh, and you can develop a new skill set um, using those points. You can um, raise a focus attribute by spending, I think, 15. And if you spend 20 or maybe it's 25, you can get a um, increase in your actual base attribute. Um, the caveat to all of these is that you have to be setting that up during play. Mm -hmm. You can't just say, well, today I'm a point smarter. Right? Maybe you have to be going to school. Maybe you have to be doing some research. Maybe you have to be taking some experimental drugs. Um, something in the story has to be lined up to make any of these happen. So, mm. if it's just a matter of learning to play the guitar, you just say through a couple of sessions, I'm going to spend some downtime playing the guitar. Um, and then you get to add your new skill set. So, it's <laughs> not super robust or innovative. Um, but it does lean heavily into this is the character I decided I want to play. And if I want to that character to grow, that character needs to be that character. Very cool. I, I, I love how it plays to those in order to, to level up. Mm -hmm. And it's very, I mean, it's, it, it, to call it leveling up is, is probably not fair to the expectation. It's such a <laughs> minor change. It's very yeah. incremental. Um, mm -hmm. you're not going to feel like, like, I know with a lot of games like D and D you come into a new session after leveling up and you're like, Oh my God. Uh, I, yeah. Right. Yeah. There is no moment of glowing light generally around, mm -hmm. yeah. around this. I have, I come from games though that have just like straight XP spends on like, you know, like any skill is three XP or something like that. So it's like, you're constantly going mm -hmm. forward mm -hmm. a little bit mm -hmm. each session yep. so i always every time people are like it's a whole level i'm like a level of what like mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not the kind of game that i play the, the right. part that hasn't really been play tested is that hopefully the numbers work out that every session if you want and if you were diligent and your moderator was diligent about tracking stuff you can get a plus one in something in in sorry in a skill set mm -hmm. right that's the, like the cheapest thing so if you're really like pushing it at least every other session you could get a plus one so you have the option of getting like at least a little better yeah. somewhere. Or you could save it up and then get a, a, yeah. a big thing later. Because obviously increasing the, the game mechanic is attribute plus skill set roll equal to or under, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So if your attribute is bumped up by one, suddenly all of the things you do with that attribute is plus one. So mm -hmm. obviously it should be more expensive. And they're harder to do. We know human will. Uh, if you're going to go to the gym and work out and try and get a better physique, it takes a lot of effort, so it should take yeah. a lot of points. Absolutely. 
so what effect does this advancement have on the narrative? Uh, like, does the mechanical benefit represent something in the story? Or is it uh, well, a connection that we have to make? Ourselves? Yeah, that, that's the requirement. If you if you want to to just if you want to have an advancement, you have to justify it to the to the table, and um, ideally, you do that through some sort of role playing, hmm. um, or at least resource expenditure, right? Like yeah. I've got a gym membership, or I have gone back to college, um, or something like that, right? Oh, very cool. Um, or so you can't or, just be saying that oh i'm going to increase this point here uh just because i think it would benefit me even though i didn't use any of it right for the last right. the entire campaign right that's the intention and and i like it because you can really hook players in like i am playing a native character and i don't have any combat skills or i want to raise my combat skills well that's because i've been secretly training with the insurgency for the last six months and mm-hmm. nobody knows it right um so that kind of thing can really tie back into the setting and developing the character as a person too. Very cool. I like that. All right. Is there anything else that you want to uh, tell us about uh, Blue Planet uh, before we head out, or or anything you want to highlight on the Kickstarter? Uh, now that we're in the the last uh, uh, you know few days, probably since this episode releases, or or half of the campaign. Sure. Um. um I. I. This has ranged. This whole process of creating these series this series has ranged much farther and more in depth than i would have anticipated i'm not sure that there's anything that we haven't at least touched on um i i think this maybe i'll say who i think this game would appeal to Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um if you like science fiction check if you like hard science fiction the idea that it's based in in as much as possible and still be science fiction science i would say check if you have um if you are an environmentalist or have sympathies with the, the environmental plight of our world, check, check. Um, if you want to make characters that are evocative of the game you're trying to play, I, I think we have landed there. So that would be a, a check mark. Mm. Um, if you want to have control over a lot of nuanced control over who your character is, I think there's a lot of that in there. Um, if you want a simple system that still evokes and supports a, a hard science fiction setting. I, I hope that's where we've landed. Um, I, I'm counting on them, the, the Kickstarter being uh, generous enough that we can make them beautiful books. Mm-hmm. Um, but even if they're not, um, if we don't, if we can't make the physical copies as beautiful as we want them to be, uh, or if you're the kind of person that has gone all you know PDF at this point, um, we are, going to be providing those um, in, a, in as user-friendly um, format as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're actually going to lean in a little bit to some to hard, hardship pricing on some of those as well, um, which we hope increases accessibility a little bit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing that I, and, and I will admit this is entirely salesmanship, but um, if you don't want to wait, uh, and you're just getting into Blue Planet and don't already have some of the previous editions, on the day the campaign closes, um, depending on your pledge level, you're going to get a big download of, of the currently existing PDFs. So you can dive right in if you want to start reading. There's, you know, It'll certainly um, be a lot of changes in additional material, but it will still mm-hmm. give you a good solid grounding in the world of Blue Planet for sure. Very cool. I'm like so that. excited to see like what this looks like and yeah. like this has really like this has made me even more excited about it. Like this I'm was glad to hear it. Yeah. I'm <laughs> it's good. It's good. Absolutely. I love the changes that you guys have made. It's... Mm-hmm. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us to talk about Blue Planet Recontact. Well, uh, the thanks is all mine to you. Um you guys are great and this is a great chance for us to talk about a game they're really excited about. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Can you remind everyone where they can find you online uh, and the things that you're working on? Yeah, uh, uh, for for, uh, timeliness on a daily basis, Twitter uh, at Biohazard Jeff. uh, And then our website, uh, www.biohazardgames.us. And then, of course, the Kickstarter page. Um, You can find out how that's going uh, just by going there. And there's ways to reach us through that page as well. We'll have links to all of those things in our show notes as well. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sitting down with us. And thank you to everyone for tuning in.
That was a joy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Call to action. Yeah, like that. Okay, well, we are here back at the end of the episode. Mm -hmm. It's like, did you ever read that book, The Monster, at the end of this book with Grover? No. It's like one of my favorite children's books. No. Okay, but anyway, he's like, we're here at the end of the book. Oh. (laughs) Um, So so, (laughs) that just made me, random thought, made me think of that. (laughs) Jeff was such a fantastic guest to have on again. Um, I really enjoyed the discussion that we had this episode. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's always delightful to talk to, but like, I, I loved that we got to break down some of the game design and like really work through why he was doing some of the things he was doing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There was a lot of really good stuff there. I I just realized I didn't finish this portion of the (laughs) the call to action, but that's okay. But yeah. Uh, We do have a few things before we let you go for the episode. Uh, First, if you've liked what you've heard on today's episode series, uh, you can actually go ahead and check out the Blue Planet Kickstarter. The link is in the show notes. Uh, As of this recording, another stretch goal is just about to be taken care of. They are, yeah, just under $300 away from the next Kickstarter goal. Uh, So we might even hit that by the time this episode releases. Uh, With only three more uh, goals to go before the end of their stretch goals list. That's awesome. Because didn't they already have to put out more? They hit the other ones like day one, didn't they? Yeah, this is the second stretch goal list. And uh, yeah, they're um, they're almost done with that too. Uh, I don't know if there's going to be more after that, but uh, I'm really excited to find out. Yeah, I'm... And I'm so excited for Jeff that it's going so well. Like, yeah, it's absolutely. always It's always good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Don't forget that April is Podchaser's Reviews for Good campaign. You can leave a review on your favorite podcasts. They'll donate 25 cents to Meals on Wheels. And if creators respond to it, they will change it to 50 cents. Uh, this works for both shows as a whole and for specific episodes. So if you have one that you specifically love or, you know... Um, I guess not love to, but really just, just help. Just only say nice things. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) um, But you can leave specific episode reviews. Uh, We will, as always, read reviews on our shows and we, we will read those episode ones too. Um, So you can let us know what's your favorite. Mm -hmm. Um, Like this one from Michael of Healy on Podchaser. A good look at the process of creating characters in a wide variety of game systems. Well, thank you. Chef kiss, sweet and to the point. Yeah, right to the point. Uh, and and thank you so much for listening, Michael. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But we also have a bonus one. Uh, since this <gasps> is the last uh, episode going out in April, and since this campaign is in full force, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and read another one we got on Podchaser recently. From whoa, whoa, whoa. That's like... Can this, you do that? Uh, Brian. It's our show. There are rules. <laughs> I'm breaking the rules. I'm breaking the rules. It's okay, April. Ryan has gone crazy with power. <laughs> He's going to read two reviews. Two reviews. <laughs> you are mad with power. I am bad with power. Uh, and I'm going to read this review from Brick Steelhead from Podchaser. And and I love this. Uh, it's it's it, it's in very advertising uh, format, which is fantastic. So. Yeah, please read it in like an old timey radio voice, maybe. <laughs> Are you suffering from alcoholism? Do you have stacks of unplayable character sheets higher than their dog is tall? Are you that player who brings a backup PC to the non lethal game just in case? If so, then Chumley, this pod's for you. C Squared takes me way back home to the first fun I ever had in TTRPGs, cooking up the peoples. Its hosts are the raddiest, its jokes are the daddiest, its goals are the loftiest, its tone is the softiest, its <laughs> games the artiest, its guests the smartiest. Listen for the episodes that are essentially Kickstarter Spotlight Let's Play Session Zero and for those that are, but like, what even is personhood, you know? Squints and raises eyebrows, Elon musk <laughs> 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 All of them are great. 
how to get six stars out of five? Spotlight some of them old timey games. What have wild and woolly character generation methods? Your Gamma World 7th edition. Your Warhammer Fantasy Roleplays 3rd edition. You're into the odds. Your Atomic Highways. Your Dark Heresies. Et alia. Wow, I can't believe you held on through that whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> that was a long review. That was a long review, and it was fantastic. But also, I appreciate all of the thought that went into that. Like, <laughs> that was intense. That was so good. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Brick Steelhead. That was fantastic. Yeah, and we um, we definitely are looking at some old-timey games. Mm -hmm. um, that was a discussion that we just had the other day that we're... We always try to kind of, like, mix and match, like, yeah. crunch and... You know, your potato chips and your jello. Yep. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we want to start uh, mixing and matching some like new Kickstarter spotlight kind of stuff and some of the old timey um, classics. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, after probably series 40, uh, we'll be able to start diving into uh, some more variety of games as well. Um, mm -hmm. and since I think we're starting to plan. Uh, a bit more ahead of the t the the times, I guess we could say. <laughs> we say that for now. I feel we like we that. always do really well for a little while, and then like we're and like then stuff busy. happens. Right. Uh, yeah. Life is life; it happens. <laughs> it, be, uh, it do be like that. It do be like that. But uh, we'll see what we can do. Uh, so yeah. stay stay tuned, uh, Brick Steelhead at Alia. Uh, we will uh, we'll see what we can do for old timey games. Yeah, prepare to give us that sixth star. Be ready. <laughs> Be ready. <laughs> well, don't, give another five stars, maybe, but don't just leave one extra star somewhere else. Oh, yeah. To be clear, don't. <laughs> right. Don't like tag like one star. I would have given this six stars, but. But what I did instead was do a five and a one, which cancels out to be like mm, two like and a Like a three, half. two and a half It's like, not, no, that's no. not. <laughs> just watch your star math, everyone. It's fine. That's all we have for this episode, which <laughs> honestly I think was more than enough. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, next week we will take our week off and then we will be getting into a series that we've been wanting to cover since the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, so stay tuned for May. It's going to be very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, until then, take care, stay safe, drink water, and keep making those amazing people. We will see you next time. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time.
Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit oneshotpodcast.com where you'll find other great shows like Session Zero. Session Zero is a discussion podcast that seeks to explore the psychology of role-playing. Each episode will feature RP concepts, stories, and tropes viewed through the lens of psychology by clinical psychologist Porter Green and industrial organizational psychologist Steve Discount. Join us on the couch for the next session. I did it. I did it too. I'm clicking as well. Wonderful. There's a little squiggle when I talked, so I guess that means Oh, perfect. That means it's working. Nailed it. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, and you'll be so proud of me, Amelia. Um, I got my printer working. Oh! I I can actually print out stuff now, and I've got physical character sheets that I can actually write on. I am overjoyed. I don't. I know. So you are well, you are I mean, some of the only people to to have ever used those character sheets yet because they're kind of kind of new. Yeah, I I really like them. Um, We've already discovered some there's... layout issues that we need to address, but yeah, uh, yeah, of course, that happens a lot. Isn't that always the case? I know. It's like the moment you you share it or have anybody else look at it, you're like, oh no! Like when you send out your child's birthday invitations right. and you didn't put the date anywhere in the well, there's oh, the no. areas where you need to write. <laughs> The the longer sentences are kind of some of the smaller boxes, so it's it may you may oh, find you them a little cramped in, in terms of today's That's use. Fine. But. I'll see if I uh, switch to keyboard or not in between uh, filling other things out. I thought that was a cat at first, <laughs> and you're on mute, Amelia, or am I on mute? Oh no, I muted my. Uh... Other microphone too. I oh. forgot so that it wouldn't record a bunch of noise. Yeah, she she's a tiny puppy. She is. She's not going to get much bigger. Peggy. Oh. Peggy. Oh. Ugh, hang on. Peggy. <laughs> what are you doing? Get on my stuff. You can't be in here if you're going to be naughty. We have um, minor puppy issues. Oh. <laughs> I guess if you're going to have issues, puppy issues are some of the best ones. Because mm-hmm. that means you have a puppy. That's true. Uh, and Amelia's puppy, uh, Peggy, is super adorable looking. Just a little fuzzball. There, there she is. <laughs> Look at that thing. <laughs> yeah, she's she's very small. Again. So adorable. See, that's, that's the size of a, a dog that I wouldn't mind having. Uh, yeah. Especially if if she doesn't get much bigger than that. No, she'll be like, I don't know, like maybe twenty two pounds or something like mm-hmm. that. She's a golden doodle, but she's like bred from a smaller line yeah. of dogs, and then she was the runt of the litter. So yeah, my she's... my wife's uh, or my my mom's husband uh, had gotten a black lab recently, uh, starting mm. from puppy. And that thing is getting uh, extremely large. Yeah, those things are huge. My parents have a sheep doodle and they were, my dad was here yesterday. um, And I was like, this dog is so heavy. (laughs) Because I was trying to hold her on the leash. Um, But she and Peggy are best friends. So there you go. To play together. Uh, But then I have to listen to my own voice, which I really don't like. (laughs) You just have somebody else do it. (laughs) And then they can write it. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I've surprisingly like gotten over that. I guess maybe not surprisingly after three years of this podcast and you know, like another year, year and a half of the other one. Like, I'm, I'm pretty okay with it now. Mm-hmm. Once you edit your own voice, it's uh, for a while. You just are, are just accepting that that's mm-hmm. the way it sounds. Um. I took uh, I took deceptive and cool headed for psyche. Did I say that? I'm not sure I said that. I don't know, but Ryan will find out when he edits it. That's very true. <laughs> I'll leave both in too if it's there. Because why not? I'm finally going to see the doctor tomorrow. But oh yeah, 
uh, I sent her a message and was like, hey, do I see you for this? Should I go see a specialist? And she's like, well, we can talk about conservative treatment options or here's the names of some specialists that I would recommend. And they were all surgeons. And I was like, oh, that's Lord. not. Oh, OK. <laughs> hmm. No, thank you. Aggressive. Yeah. Well, I, it's been a problem for eight years. Yeah. Um, And it's just getting worse. So, yeah. It, I, I always recommend the physical therapy route first. Um, I see a physical therapist for my ailments. And uh, the, the thing that's helped the most with those sort of things has been um, the ultrasound therapy. Uh, they do help. that for like my shoulder. Because um, I've been going to physical therapy on and off for my back for yeah. years. Um, the hard part for me is that like the one of the first things that they want you to do for carpal tunnel is anti-inflammatories. Mm -hmm. And I can't take those. Oh, boy. So I'm like out of luck. <laughs> yeah. So we have to jump right to like steroids or a cortisone injection or something oh, like jeepers. that. Because I can't. Um, the only option to take anti-inflammatories is to go off of my lithium, which is a big no. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a hard path. <laughs> we're not really. I went to the doctor for something. Oh, last weekend when I wasn't feeling well. And she was like, yeah, it says that this interacts with your Lexapro. So if you could just not take that for a couple of days. I was like. That's an antidepressant. So no, I'm I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> like, don't just tell me to go off my meds for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. it seems very irresponsible. Yeah, no, that makes sense though. I think they look at my med list and are just like, hmm, why don't you just go home? I don't want to deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> I did manage to fit them all in my uh, my little water bottle thing though. Nice. I know. Makes cool noise. <laughs> <laughs> Great for recordings. Mm -hmm. But then I always have water when I have my pills. That's true. If I were running this campaign, oh, sorry, that was my cat. <laughs> I just realized that this Zoom call wasn't work related, and that if I wanted to drink a beer while we were doing it, I could oh, probably you get do away. Do whatever with it. you want. <laughs> I have the power. Look at that! It's your weekend. I'm trying to start looking at names because I know that that's going to come up and I'm so bad at it. I don't know. I got an email today that like referred to me as Mrs. And I was like, no. Ooh. I like when I get ones at work that say Dr. Krause. And I'm like, you are wrong on both of those. But thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Good try. Good try. Good effort. All right. Uh, now we can stop. Uh, now that Peggy is barking in the background. <laughs> it's fine. I know. Yay! Huzzah! I did a click. Oh, that was really loud. Uh, my game should be fine enough. I should be okay. I just hate that when you like do it and you're like, something, something isn't right, but also I haven't touched anything and it was fine last time and I don't understand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, one of the things uh, my my H8 recorder um, that I have everything hooked up into, uh, when I unplug it and transport it wherever and plug it back in, it uh, it has a built-in noise gate on there okay. that I set the threshold to negative 50 dBs. So anything below that, it just cuts off. Nice. Um, but when I plug it back in, it resets to negative 80. So oh. then it's just picking everything up. Yeah. And and I have to keep remembering, oh yeah, I plugged it in. Let me let me change that back. Otherwise the next time I record it it's got yeah, all put a the little sticky note on your arm on your microphone arm or something. Yeah. All the horrible background noise of my studio, which is negligibly there in the first place. But Yeah, not like me with all kinds of noise happening. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. I really gotta find a better way to I don't know. Yeah, I think the only thing that... You're on, like, your third microphone, and I'm still using the original one yeah. from <laughs> three years ago or whatever. It still works. It does. It does. I need to get an arm for it, I think. Yeah. Um, need to finally break down and do that. I have different headphones than I used back then. So that's true. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Got the new headphones uh, from James and the, the oh, yeah, this no, I, microphone. Yeah, I, I was going to say I bought new ones, but I didn't. This was uh, Shadow of the Cabal money, actually. Oh, yeah. I bought these ones because mine kept, like, 
being weird and then like occasionally gave feedback and Tanner was mm-hmm. like, I can't stand you. <laughs> he, yeah. like, mailed me new headphones. Like, I'm sorry. I wonder if uh if we could talk to James about uh getting uh one of these uh, mics for you. Yeah. Uh, the ATR or AT, yeah, ATR, whatever it's called. Yeah, maybe. Because um, I feel like I'm outgrowing this one, you know? Yeah. Well, plus the, the whole room that you're in and all that sort of stuff. Um, that one mm-hmm. will pick up less of the reverb and everything. Yeah, and it's it's an echoey room. Please. Yeah, and if you get like an arm like like I've got here, you can just keep it off to the side on your desk and then just swing it over because I can I can literally yeah. just move it back. Yeah, I want to do that. I want to get one that like attaches to the desk because I can't like screw anything into my walls. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, I need to do something because I just also don't have a lot of desk space. Yeah, do what you can. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, I didn't color code anything. Son oh, of my God. I knew something looked wrong. Uh-huh. And okay. also, um, the you said you might have had one, but you forgot it. Did you remember I, it? No, I, I couldn't. Okay. That's fine. I'll just delete that. Finally. You can put it in the outtakes for next time. Dear listeners, I had a cold open thing, and it was going to be great. So I'll let you just imagine it. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, no, I have no clue, like, what it was even about, much less, like, yeah. Yeah. No, no that's fine. It's long gone. Um. So, wait, okay. It might uh, not have even been a cold open thing. It might not have been. Who knows? <laughs> we, we'll never it's know It's my now. brain. It could have been anything. <laughs> it could have been anything. <laughs> um. Okay, so we'll have you start. Okay. And then we'll have me go there. Oh, wait. Uh. Yeah, this whole thing should be me. And then you for the pod chaser stuff. Uh, and then I'll just finish that up. Um, and then who's reading the review this time? Um, how about me? Because I want to. Oh, that's great. <laughs> um, and then I'll just color that there. And we'll see where it lands up here. I had to um, explain pod chaser to jude the other day oh and he was like what is pod chaser and like why is aaron all mad that somebody left a review on like what our show about like on it was like some kind of like reply guy review on like every single episode that they've put out of this like babylon 5 podcast that he's doing oh and i was like okay so pod chaser is this thing and like and he's like so it's like a different itunes i was like no i would describe it as like yelp if iTunes was McDonald's, <laughs> like <laughs> it is like, it's, it's not like putting out the podcast. It's just no. like it finding and talking about podcasts. It, it like, feels it's, like, it feels like I, the IMDB of podcasts. There you go. That's probably yeah. a better way to put it. I was like trying to find like a way to explain it because I was like, it's not like aggregating them. It's not like, mm-hmm. but, like, I'm like, you're leaving reviews and you can find stuff as a creator. You can say, hey, this is a podcast that I made. I also guessed it on this one episode over here. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, so yeah, you're like an IMDB is probably a better yeah. thing. And but it's, I it's... described it as Yelp of Apple was McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, okay, so not a big deal. And I was like, no, probably not. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty nice because it um it verifies everything that you put in there too. So if it's like. I know oh. I've said that I was a guest on like some podcast somewhere and like. I don't remember which one it was, but whoever runs the podcast still has not verified it, and it bothers me because it was like two years ago, and I won't show up in my thing. <sighs> That's annoying. That's right. Come on, verify now, it. Now, no one will ever know. Hey, if that person's listening to this, uh, because this is definitely going in the outtakes, uh, verify Amelia. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's see. I'm starting, so I will yawn one more time and then. <laughs> All right, I'll just do the I look recap. Very at the sleepy. Oh, you can be on again. Oh, even though I slept till noon. <sighs> Ugh, I go, okay. I went to bed at two, so and then I woke up at nine. I I think I fell asleep by eleven, but the two pre- nights before that, I only got like an hour each night, so I was oh, yeah. exhausted. Your body's just like, give me, give me um, sleep. Right. Well, and then, of course, I haven't taken my ADHD meds today. So it was like, how about we Mm -hmm. do nothing but sleep and eat? I mean, that's fair. And I was like, yeah, but I got stuff to do. Like, make cake from a box. (laughs) 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 Anyway. Okay. All right.
Call to action time. Action, action. And so we, just, we gotta have a set. It bothers me that there's no like. There's no like. We, just, like, we need to get one of those like movie snaps like, and action. <laughs> Which I can't like properly clap because I have a brace on my head right now. Action. Call to <laughs> action. Yeah, like that. <laughs> <laughs> just do that. You saying call to and me being like, yeah, like that. That's the sound clip. That's it right there. <laughs> I'll see what I can do. Thanks. <laughs> You're a gem. <laughs> uh, maybe some explosions behind there. Who knows? Okay. I'm going to record the recap uh, while we're here. You don't need to be recording for this part. That's that's good. <laughs> You're too late. I'm doing it anyway. <laughs> e- Did it. I also have waveforms. All right. I am um, pulling my character sheet back up so that I can remember what I did. <laughs> oh, I'm pulling my character sheet back up too. Oh, it's on a clipboard. <laughs> oh, it actually looks really nice, though. It's like, high fidelity it's, that way. Like, it looks beautiful. <laughs> you can just kind of see Oh, it, that's but... gorgeous. Yeah. We can that see was it. a it's good in investment. The, it's in the completed characters folder. Yeah, I bought it almost entirely because of the NES stuff. We get so many electronic submissions, and I wanted to be able to like take notes and like not try and like sit at my computer and scroll and you know. Mm-hmm. Can I? Um, I know this isn't a game design direct, essentially a game design podcast, but it's very about very specific parts of game design. I would love to make a plug for um, aspiring game designers to use their character sheets effectively mm. um i have found both working on um upwind and blue planet that that's a great place to start uh, i think it could be a mistake to start writing out your rules your mechanics your character creation because if you're like me writing is hard work but if you know what you want to do for your character creation even if you are not a great graphic designer you can create a character sheet even with a pencil and blank paper it really mm-hmm. helps shape your thinking and you can start your, your tweaking and your iterating and your play testing just using the character sheet and you go oh, a yeah. long way towards a final version of your character creation and rules using the character sheet as the guide um, much easily, much more easily than re- writing and rewriting and rewriting, at least in, for, for my money. Yeah, absolutely. That's something I think we talked about, we touched on briefly when we did our Star-Crossed episodes um, with Alex Roberts, talking about like the intentionality of the things that are on the character sheet mm-hmm. and like what it tells you about the game. I would love to sit down with like a bunch of game designers and kind of do a panel about like what your character sheets say about your game and like mm-hmm. how the design of that, you know, like goes along with what the game's supposed to do. And like, I'm I'm fascinated by the concept of character sheets. Like, I don't know. I mean, I think they're easy enough to make in Google Sheets, too, to even start, like, sizing things and see, like, how much yep. room does this take up and how important is it to the game? And, you know, I don't know. I think that's a, a, an interesting. I didn't think ever about, like, kind of starting there. But yeah, how they look and, like, what they tell you is important is fascinating to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that makes sense to me because uh, I, I started my character stuff uh, with Chimera as character sheets mm-hmm. um, and designing the sheets. So that's interesting. Yeah, it might not be a revelation in general. People may, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And I do that all the time. But for me, yeah. it was like an important realization in my design process. Yeah, I like that. Um, yeah, we can we can fit that in. Um, I know on a previous uh, series, we asked about uh, character sheets on there um do you remember what the one that was no um okay let me let me find it real quick um <laughs> i'm trying to like think of our list of it, was, episodes. it was a very it was a very good question and um let's see here uh, 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 uh. let's see yep here it is no nope, that's not it that's close but that's not it um, so it's got to be right before then. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was. It was a recent one, right? It was fairly recent. Yeah. So I don't, maybe was it maybe Quest? No, it wasn't Quest. Um, oh, Unbound, maybe. 
I don't think it was Unbound. Listen to no. that one, but I don't recall that specifically. Yeah. And anyone, anyone can wear the mask doesn't have character sheets. Right. Uh, Burn Bright. I think we talked about that with uh, about it being an online format, so that doesn't yeah. exactly apply. Um, My brother was so funny because he's playing that one, too. And he was like, uh, he had some question. And I was like, well, I don't know. I'll ask some of the designers. And he's like, yeah, okay, whatever. And so, like, I tweeted about it. And, like, James DeCrosso got back to me. And Mark was like, Oh, I didn't realize, like, you were that tight with people. And I was like, what do you think that I do? Like, what do you... (sighs) I was like, buddy, I went on a date with one of the designers of the game that you're about to play. So, like, yes, I know them. Like, she helped Nate with his science project. (laughs) It's it's fine. All right, I think I can uh, take this ca- this question and modify it just slightly. Okay. Um, yeah, I know there was one, but I couldn't tell you where it was or what it was. Mm-hmm. It's about the intention behind the sheets design, uh, that sort of stuff. And um, what are we on? What are we? 38. 38, there we go. Hello. Yeah, I remember writing it, but I don't remember when. Yeah, put it right there. Uh, we'll move this. Does win even matter anymore? (laughs) Exactly, right? No. I like to pretend it doesn't because my son is turning 10 and that makes me feel old. I've been a parent for a decade. It's wild um, that my son is half your son's age uh, right now. And I'm like, that, what? (laughs) It's too long. Uh Uh-huh. I've kept a human being alive for 10 years. It's an achievement. I have a plant that I've kept alive for like five years, though, so pretty proud of it. I feel like that might be the bigger achievement. Kids at least tell you when they're hungry. Mm, True. (laughs) But have you instilled a value system in your plant? No, I don't think so. I don't know. I I haven't really asked it. (laughs) Sorry, Ryan, I didn't work. mean to throw a curveball. No, I'm, that I'm perfectly fine easier. with that. Uh, I, I, I love the question. So I think adding it right after uh, the process of character creation um, works really well. Um, can you talk about your process with redesigning these character sheets and how that helped guide the character creation uh, process? Um, I think that would be good. Um, yeah, I think that works. Works for me. Yep. Except for the wanna... fact that we can't ask our question of how did you get into role playing games? No. <laughs> I've got other questions for that, so it's All right. fine. All right, we're ready to get started? We're ready. All right, I'm going to give us a five count of silence so we can get that background noise and we'll get started. And you're muted, Amelia. Well, it's because my neighbors were stomping upstairs. Oh, there you go. Um, I was like trying to, like, <laughs> okay. Um, all right, now we can uh, we can start. Uh, e. I just decided that that should be a T-shirt we make. Ooh, three, two, I one, mean, clicky. Yeah, like I don't like most people don't hear it, right? No, but like we put it in our outtakes like a bunch. Oh yeah. And when we did that, like cold cuts. Yeah. Special. We always uh, we always talk about the. Uh, I always put in the outtakes the e. Of my and, clicky. And like whenever guests comment on it too. Yeah. We usually like leave that in there too. Yeah. Um, so it's alluded to. It's the it's the illusion of the clicky. Right. But we should uh like find a fancy font or somebody to do formatting or something and do there three you go. one clicky. There you go. Hey, hey, outtakes. Uh here you go. This is just for you. Three, two, one, clicky. There you go. Now we can make a t-shirt of it because no, we, we put it in the show. It's we a did. real thing. <laughs> it's a real thing. It's happening. It's happening. It's happening. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> the time has come. <laughs> oh, it's Saturday, people. Uh, <clears throat> welcome. It's, yeah, 3.20 on a Saturday. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're both acting like we're drunk already and neither of us <laughs> drinks. So... <laughs> Hey, I've got a vaccine coursing through me, uh, second dose, so I have an excuse at least. (laughs) 
don't know. I ate a sandwich. Hey. And I didn't let my dog eat antidepressants. So <laughs> I'd say that's a pretty good day. How's your day? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we've got this one. We've also got this one here by Brick Steelhead. Dang. That's a good name. That's definitely a professional wrestler, right? Um, probably. Or yet another nemesis of Dirt Stranglethorn. Or or uh unlikely companion. <gasps> Future BFF. Brick Steelhead and Dirge Sting Stranglethorn taking on the world. Oh, yeah, that's like the sequel movie. There you go. It's like he shows up in the first movie, and then like when they have an offshoot and all the other actors are like, we're too busy for this, it becomes, you know, Dirge and Brick. Yeah, Dirge and Brick. There you go. That's mm-hmm. the name of the show. Yeah. Dirge and Brick. <laughs> oh, Lord. I did. So I'll let you read Michael of Healy's. Okay. And then I'll read uh, Brick Steelhead. I almost said Steelthorn. (laughs) Brick Steelthorn. (laughs) Oh. It's hyphenated because George's mom remarried later on. (laughs) (laughs) Again. (laughs) Strangle Dash Thorn. Did you see my my tweet about uh, Nate's terrible (laughs) podcast? (laughs) About... He goes, he's like, oh, The Deathly Hallows is like a really boring movie, the second one. And he's like, it's just like, can't, or the first one he was talking about. He's like, it's just like camping and Voldemort. And I was like, camping with Voldemort. And he goes, that's a terrible podcast idea. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Uh-huh. I didn't ask, but you're not wrong. Uh huh. <laughs> so. Anybody who had that on their podcasting bingo card, Camping with Voldemort. (laughs) I don't know. Nate will not be a listener. (laughs) You really got to work on your uh, 10-year-old demographic. Yeah. Today, we're going to be learning about cooking over the fire. But it's only it's the only <laughs> thing that he knows how to cook is like potions to make you immortal. Like yep. <laughs> I burned another is, hot dog here. He has no nose, so if he gets uh, sprayed by a skunk, he'll never know. <laughs> That's a real bummer for everybody else around him, though. Uh huh. <laughs> so at least one episode is probably about that. Uh huh. How to tell Voldemort he smells like a skunk? <laughs> Oh, Voldemort, you're bad at camping. (laughs) That's another t-shirt. Camping with Voldemort. (laughs) Oh, Oh, gosh, we're hilarious. (laughs) We should do these more often on Saturdays. It's fine. Yeah, it's why I don't know why we're like this right now. Like it's you know, it's the middle of the afternoon on a Saturday. Mm-hmm, like it's not mm-hmm. late at night. It's not, you know, but look, it's neither of us has slept enough and uh camping is funny. <laughs> camping is funny. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Cold open. Cold open. I will start the countdown and uh we'll we'll get to it. Here come the fingers. Here come the fingers. <laughs> All right, I do have an intruder in here now. I know, I was going to say, we'll, we'll pause while you <laughs> see what that's all about. No, okay. Hey, what's Hi, up? Quinn. <laughs> what do you need? Pest. No, I can't hear what you're saying. Past. Past? Hug, 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 It's professional. Yeah. Hey, you're, you're talking too close to the mic. Here, let's back it up a little bit. So I mean, that's we, better than a podcast about Voldemort camping. So. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Here, we got to put this in front. And then you can talk. Talk right, in, try, talk right to this thing. <laughs> hi. Hi. She says hi. Hi. Here, let me put these on, on your ears and you can talk to Amelia. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. 
<laughs> Hello? Almost. Are you a real podcaster now? No. No? No. <laughs> oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, I think when I grow up. Yeah, what would your show be about? Uh, I don't know. Oh, well, you've got time to think about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Bye. 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 <laughs> that was fun. All right. Bye. All right, Bye. I'll see you in a little bit, okay? It's almost done. Yep, I'm almost done. I just got to <laughs> finish up this part of the recording and then...